If you have questions, um, please put them in um, the chat. Val will be moderating those, um, answering those that she is able to. And if she feels that there's a point that she could maybe stop uh, some of the demo and ask questions, she'll kind of make those determinations or save it to the end. So Val, you want to say a little bit about who you are and maybe a little known fact about you? Hi, everyone. Uh... Um, it is true. My name is Val, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm a pen tester here on Red Team. Um, well, uh, in a past life, I used to teach um, creative problem solving and effective communication, and now I break expensive things. Um, Woohoo! <laughs> woo Both lines of work are good. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, a little known thing about me. Um, I, I speak Italian and, and um, I enjoy reading Italian uh, uh, thrillers. Oh, did not know that. I'm, true. I, I'm already learning stuff. So good. It's true. Well, Val, um, John, and Brian, thank you so much for all your work in getting us prepared for this. Um, Mish and the other, other rest of our teams, thanks for getting this pulled together. And with no uh, further ado, I am going to hop off here. And um, John, I'm going to let you go ahead and kick us off. Okay, let me get my screen shared here. Can everybody see my screen? It should be a, a Linux terminal window. Yes, I can. All right, excellent. Um, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing that we typically do when we are on an internal pen test um, is we run a tool called Responder. What Responder does is it kind of, it, it's basically a liar is what it is. So there's certain uh, protocols, um, multicast name resolution protocols like LLMNR, MBTNS, and what those do is they broadcast to the whole network and it's like, hey, where's machine A? And what Responder does is it says, oh yeah, that's me, I'm machine A. And then the machine that asks for that starts talking to whatever responder tells it basically. And in so doing, it passes things like Windows hashes um, and other things that we can then either crack offline or relay to other hosts. Um, so it's a, a very useful tool for attacking AD environments. So let's get that fired up. Um, dash I for interface. Uh, dash W for WPAD and dash F to force WPAD authentication. And let's see what we get out of this. Oh, there, there goes some stuff. So you're seeing the domain name, hackme.local, some usernames, their associated hashes coming through. It'll skip previously captured ones. And all of this gets logged. So typically what we do on an engagement is we'll fire this up in the morning. Um, it, it's pretty dependent on user activity. So the best time to do it is in the mornings or maybe after lunch when users are coming back, they're signing into their computers, they're getting back to work and there's lots of network traffic going on. Um, now, since this is just a demo environment, um, it's, it's very small and there's not gonna be a whole lot for us to capture. So I'm actually gonna kill this now because it should be about done. So once we've captured some of those hashes, uh, we can go into the, oops. the logs folder for the tool. And within here, it's got the all the session logs. And you've also got files like this here where it's captured uh, NTLM v2 hashes um, from HTTP. This is likely from a WPAD forced authentication. You also have to see things like this where it's, it's captured some SMB and then also web dev traffic. Now, if you were to actually look in these text files, 
This is what you saw scrolling by on the screen. So you've got the username, the domain. Come here. Come here. Come here. And the uh, the associated hash. Now you'll notice that lots of these are duplicated. Um, the the reason for that is that these uh, hashes have salt associated with them. Um, and the, the hash may look a little bit different because of that, um, but it's, it's all basically the same password going on there. So what we can do is we're gonna take all of those text files, we're gonna dump them into a file called hashes.txt. Everything's there. So then what we can do is we can run a tool called hashcat. Um, now this is a, a virtual machine that I'm running this on and it doesn't actually have um, a GPU. So typically what we will do on an actual engagement is we'll run this through what's called a password cracking rig. Um, it's got a bunch of high powered graphics processor units in it, which are very efficient at cracking hashes. Um, for me, since this is a demo and because we are interested in doing this in a timely manner. I'm going to use a very short password list. Um, and so what I'm doing here is so the, the dash M is basically telling it what type of um, hashes we're cracking. The 5600 is for NTLM v2. The, the next item there is the that list of password hashes that I just made. Um, after that, we are going to put the list to our passwords text file. And this is just a, a list. You can get these off the dark web or all sorts of different places. Um, one that people might be familiar with is called RockU, and it comes with uh, Kali distros. And lastly, we are going to do dash O for output. We're going to write this to a file called cracked.txt. And the dash force is basically because I'm not actually running uh, GPUs and this is just gonna kind of force it to try to compile something that it works with in, in the meantime. It's definitely not as fast as an actual GPU, but it takes a second here. And so there we go. It ran pretty quick. It was a short password list. I think there's only about uh, 10 or I guess 1000 passwords in that list. But what you can see here is we did recover some. So we got five out of 13, um, several of those were salted, but we definitely got some results. So if we take a look at that cracked.txt file, you can see we got a password for the user L Miller on the hackme.local domain. And her password is summer 2020. So uh, super secure password there, L Miller. Um, so now we've got a credential that we can use against Active Directory and we could do a lot of stuff with this. We could use it for additional enumeration. We could see what shares are out there. We could log into the user's workstation while they're on lunch break and see what kind of applications are running, um, all, all sorts of stuff. Um, for our purposes today, what I'm gonna show you is a, a Bloodhound ingester that uses Python. Um, and what we're gonna do, so dash C all is um, the, the types of information that this ingester is gonna try to pull down from the domain. Um, the domain hackme.local user L Miller and her super secure password summer 2020. Lastly, we're going to throw in a name server um, just so that all of this works out nicely during the demo and everything resolves. And this information you would probably find from um, other parts of your test, like finding uh, through Nmap or uh, Nessus or whatever um, uh, application you're using to discover assets. So you might find a name server, you might find domain controllers, things like that, and those IP addresses. So. Let's run this. And of course, it got most of the information we need, but not all of it. So I'm gonna run this one more time. So there's a lot of uh, moving parts to this demo. We basically have to have um, 
a functional Active Directory environment. Okay, there we go. So the reason I was running that over and over and over is I wanted to capture some session data. And you'll notice the, the first few attempts here, I got information about the domain, the number of computers, number of users, groups, etc. cetera. Um, but one thing we didn't get was user is logged on. Um, so for this demo, I have uh, scripts running to um, imitate actual traffic and log users in and out and things like that. And so those first few times that I ran that, that user wasn't actually run, but it eventually happened for us, which is fantastic. So in a large active directory environment, um, these Python ingesters can run for a long time. I've seen them go for many minutes, uh, even hours in large domains with lots of trusts and things of that nature. We're talking like tens of thousands of users, hundreds of thousands of computers, things like that. Uh, but anyway, once it collects all the information, we will, let's start up Neo4j. This is basically the database um, that Bloodhound uses. And, oh, also one thing I should mention. So these JSON files are what that, uh, that Python ingester created for us. So after we start up the Neo4j database, we're going to start the Bloodhound GUI. And we'll get signed in here. At this point, we're gonna upload the data that we got. So it's four files for computers, domains, groups, and users. Um, it actually looks like I forgot to clear my database the last time that I did this. Let me do that real quick for us. Let's re-upload. All right, so now you can see the database information and it has all that summary information we saw before, plus a few extra things like ACLs and relationships. Um, what this tool is really good for is it basically draws out in graphical form uh, kind of the layout of the domain. And what we use it for as pen testers, you can do things like run queries on different hosts, on users. Like for example, if I wanna find all domain admins, this is a pre-built query. And domain admins is the group here, member of, we've got the administrator user, we've also got rsmithda. So those are our two domain admins on this, this network. The other thing, and this, this is super useful to us as pen testers, if the, the goal is to try, to try to get domain administrator on the network is find shortest paths to domain admins. And let me show you what this looks like. Now this, this is why I needed that session information to come in. So sometimes you do have to run Python ingesters a lot to, to capture session information. You can also, rather than doing just C dash all, you can run specific um, uh, um, an option to pull down those sessions and repeatedly, because the more session information you get, uh, the better chance you're gonna have of finding a path. So here we've got our, our graph laid out here. Again, it starts, I, I like to work backwards um, when I'm in Bloodhound because it kind of helps me understand where we want to get to first and how we're going to get there. So we start with the domain admins group over here. We can see the member of is rsmithda, which we already saw. rsmithda has a session on win7-a.hackme.local. So he's probably signed in in some way. Um, we don't know for sure how. It could be remote desktop. He might have uh, uh, a mapped network drive. It, it could be a variety of things. What's also interesting about this is we can see there's an admin to win7-hackme.local and that user is E. Thompson. And I definitely saw some traffic from E. Thompson going by in Responder. So what we're gonna try to do is get NTLM Relay, 
which is a tool I mentioned before, to basically take E. Thompson's hash by having a responder say, hey, I'm the computer you're looking for. Take his hash, pass it over to this Win7 machine, have it do a little bit of magic in the background. Um, basically what it does is it starts a service, runs it as the system account, and then executes some commands. So what, what we're gonna, the goal out of this is to obtain um, a shell on Win7. So without further ado, let's get to it. That's our path that we're gonna follow here to try to get domain admin. Um, one thing that we should probably do first is we need to verify that our target computer has SMB signing disabled. This is a, a pretty big requirement of using tools like NTLM Relay. And to do that, we're gonna run crack map exec. Um, it has a feature where you can generate a relay list and dump it out to the targets.txt file that I've got listed there. Um, and then I'm gonna run it on the entire slash 24 network that I'm on. Um, but you could also target individual machines this way. And so I'm just gonna kill this because we've got the information we need. So what you can see, we've got this data 2012, Windows Server 2012 R2, signings disabled, so that's good to know. Um, the domain controller has signing enabled, so we can't do attacks directly against the DC. Um, and then here's that, that target we saw, Win7A. And you can see that signing is disabled. So that's great news for us. That means we can definitely do the NTLM relay attack against that system. Um, for those of you that are interested, if we were to take a look at that targets, it's just got the two that had signing disabled. So data 2012 and win7 in it. So let's see here. Okay, so um, initially when I was trying this, antivirus that's installed on this machine kept capturing and blocking what I was trying to do with NTLM Relay. And I've run into this in the past on some engagements as well. So what I'm gonna talk about now is kind of basically my way of getting NTLM Relay working again and how we can get it working to bypass that antivirus. So, um, to do this, this is a, um, a MS build C sharp reverse shell that I found just online, somebody's public GitHub. Um, what this does is it can be used with a tool that comes with Windows.net. Uh, it's called MS build. And essentially what newer versions of that allow us to do is we can start these tasks so this is all just C-sharp, it's a, a reverse shell, very simple, very basic. Um, and I wanted to start with something like that so that I wasn't trying to troubleshoot, you know, is this a C2 issue or what? I just wanted to start with something that I could understand and easily diagnose and troubleshoot on my own. So MS Build compiles this on the fly and runs it. And that's the idea behind it. So I downloaded this and let me close this window out. And that's kind of our, our starting point. So the first thing that I did, rt1.xml is what I just showed you from that GitHub. That's the original code. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show the differences as I made these uh, progressions through this. So let's look at color diff is gonna show us the differences between these two files. So red is the original. And you can see IP address and port. This is me setting up my own IP and port. I also added a function that would exit cleanly if I typed exit from this shell. Um, otherwise it tended to just hang and it would leave MS build processes all over the place. And then I just deleted this comment that wasn't really doing anything. Um, so, I tried running um, uh, NTLM Relay on this and it got caught by AV. Um, now, 
let me talk about the setup a little bit real quick here. So I want to host this XML file from something I have control over, for example, a SMB server, or you could use web dev. Um, in my case, I'm just gonna use the SMB server because it's, it's easy and it's here and I'm actually gonna use the, the Samba daemon. Um, so first things first, we'll get that started. Um, the other thing that we need to do is we need to slightly modify the config file that Responder uses. Because what we're doing now is we're, we're relaying hashes instead of capturing them. So we don't want it um, to run SMB and we don't want it to do HTTP for WPAD entries. So we're gonna turn those things to off. Oops. Let's do that again with the right privileges. All right. So at this point, we can run Responder again, and it's going to do what we want so that we can relay these, these hashes. Now, the first time that I ran this, I'm going to copy and paste this because it's kind of a long command. Let me clear my screen up. This is what I, I, I ran. So we've got the NTLM relay tool. Um, I'm including SMB2 support, which is probably required on newer Windows operating systems. I'm excluding the Samba server because I'm gonna be serving my own stuff. This is the target dash T. This is that win seven dash A that we were talking about earlier. And then this is the command that I'm gonna run. So in this case, I'm running command with the following command in quotes. We're doing net use. What this is doing is it's basically connecting to my evil Samba share where I'm gonna be hosting this file from, the user that's required and the password that's required. Why that's necessary is uh, it's primarily on newer Windows 10 systems um, and 2016. Uh, greater than, I think, build 1709, um, there pretty much is no guest access anymore. Um, so you, you need to have username and password authentication. So I included that for everybody's reference here. Your mileage may vary. And in, in this case, since we're attacking a Windows 7 box, we probably didn't need that, but I included it anyway. And then what we're doing is we're running that MS build executable that I talked about before. And this path is basically the same on every version of Windows. So you've got Windows, Microsoft.NET, Framework, V4, MS build, and then it's going to that file share that we set up and our shell, um, that, that code that we were looking at before. Now, when I ran that, it got caught immediately by antivirus. And this is, the message it gave me. So we've blocked execute.bat. It was infected with IDP generic. Here's the path information, execute.bat, cmd.exe. Well, that's a bummer. So that's, that's di directly related to NTLM relay. NTLM relay, like I was telling you, when you run it, it creates a service and it runs that service, basically. The service that it's running is this batch file, execute.bat. So my first idea for bypassing this and getting past antivirus is, well, what if I just um, rename that, that executable? And so if you look in the code for NTLM relay, you can find these, this blue part here is the comment. This is what was originally there, temp execute.bat. And then it's also got a, an output file. And what I did is I basically just replaced it instead of just underscore, underscore output, it's red team, underscore, underscore output and red team dot bat. So I did that. I tried running this command again. And this time I got this. So basically the same message only with my red team dot bat changes. Um, so, okay, AV is a little bit smarter than we thought. Uh, what can we do next? So where I went from here was, uh, clear the 
this out. One second, sorry everybody. So if we take a look at this file, this is the actual path to the file that is kind of working for NTLM Relay behind the scenes. It comes out of the secretsdump.python. And this took me a little bit of trial and error to figure out because I wouldn't have expected it to come from secret stump, but that's how it is, at least on the version of Impacket that comes with Kali. So your mileage may vary, um, but that's where it is for me. So since the last attempt failed, what I did this time, rather than using the temp directory, I was like, okay, well, let's see if I can get this to work anywhere else. And so I just stuck it in the root of C. And that's what you're seeing here with the C colon backslash red team dot bat. And then same with that output file. So I'm actually modifying the tool. And, you know, this, this requires some programming expertise and things like that, but it's, it's nothing too crazy. It's not much more than a config file, honestly. So made that change, ran it again. And this time we got this from antivirus. So that's interesting. It's a slightly different message. The batch file doesn't seem to be getting caught anymore. Now it says it's actually catching that XML. Now at this point I was kind of blown away because um, I didn't think that AV could really do this, most of what's happening should be happening in memory. It's pulling this rt.xml off of a, a file share and it's being compiled on the fly in memory. Nothing's really touching the disk. So what, what is AV doing here? And at this point, I kind of went down a rabbit hole, honestly. Um, my assumption was that it was seeing something in that XML file. And so I went about trying to change that XML file to make it so that it would bypass AV. And so I'm gonna show you some of those changes now. So um, I don't know if anybody on this has ever heard of uh, Mimi Dogs, but it's a project that um, Black Hills Information Security uh, made a while back and it was talking about bypassing antivirus and their goal was to get Mimi cats to bypass AB and by one of the ways that they did this is by editing the code in Mimi cats and changing Mimi cats to Mimi dogs. It was just a simple obfuscation but it was enough to get it past certain types of antivirus. So that's kind of where my methodology was starting. Um, so I'm going to run color diff again so you can see what kind of things I changed. Basically all that I did was I opened the last file and I would run find and replace and I would replace certain things. So hello becomes hi, class example becomes red team. You can see class examples there again. Um, public class red team. Variable names, I'm just changing those. I'm changing the names of functions that I can and variable names that I can that won't impact what the program is doing, but which might trick antivirus. So streamwriter becomes dancer and I'm just thinking of random words as I'm going along here, you know, client becomes fisherman, stream becomes glue, uh, RDR becomes bananas, P becomes X. You know, it's, it's me being random, as random as I can with just find and replace, but there, there's tools out there that will do obfuscation like this for you as well, um, especially with PowerShell shell tools. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do here is we're obfuscating the code a little bit in hopes that it's gonna make antivirus say, I don't know what this is, must be fine, good luck. So anyway, We've, uh, that, that was my first change. The other thing that I changed as a part of this, I wanted to, um, one thing you'll notice that this does when it sets up all the streams and the, the network sockets and everything, it's ca calling a new process and it's spawning cmd.exe. Well, that type of thing is very common in shell code um, and malicious files. So I wanted to try to obfuscate cmd.exe a little bit. So to do that, again, this requires a little bit of code knowledge, but hopefully nothing that's 
too far beyond the realms of understanding. So what you see here, here's the original. And what I changed it to, I'm using some .NET functions. We're converting to a string. We're taking this big ugly screen, concatenating it with a period, and then an E, and then this big ugly string. And then what we're doing is we're running substring against it um, from character position 15 and length eight. And so if you were to look at that, what we're actually getting is cmd.exe. So it's that same thing, just obfuscated a little bit more, changing that file a little bit more so that hopefully antivirus doesn't catch it. So I ran this and any guesses on what happened? Same thing. Same exact thing, even in spite of all of my obfuscation efforts. And so at this point, it, it was kind of a pain to run NTLM relay over and over and over on this. Um, shutting it down and restarting it takes a little while, getting all those network, the, the bogus network communication running, things like that. So what I, I did instead is I fired up a test system with the antivirus installed and I started um, testing directly on that system. And to do that, I would basically just run this command right on the Windows command prompt. And that worked as a standard user. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. So then I tried starting a an administrative command prompt and I ran that same exact command. And it worked again, I got a shell back. And I was like, okay, so what is going on here? It, it doesn't seem to be catching um, it when I run it as a standard user or as a local admin. So then what I, I ended up doing is I, I wanted to run it as system because that's what NTLM Relay is doing for us. When it sets up that service, it runs it as the local service account. And so I grabbed a, a sysinternals tool called psexec, and you can look that up on, on your own. But basically what I did is I ran psexec-i for interactive and dash s for system, and then cmd.exe, which uh, launches a CMD process as the local system user. So now I've got a CMD process running as the system account and I ran that same thing one more time. And that got caught. So if we look at that, that error again, does anybody notice anything interesting about this? So every time it's always been IDP.generic. This has changed, the paths have changed. One thing that's always remained the same though is behavior shield. So at this point I was thinking, well, maybe it's catching behaviors instead of an actual like, uh, you know, virus signature. Maybe what it's looking for is certain processes that it knows can be dangerous like msbuild.exe in certain conditions, for example, running as the system level account. Well, okay, that's the theory anyway. So how did I prove that? Well, um, I, I also ran a scan on rt.xml using this antivirus product and no results. It, it thought it was totally fine, no issues with it at all. So that further made me think that rt.xml wasn't the issue. So, Next, what I did, simplest way that I could think of to bypass this is if it's looking for that behavior, if it's looking for msbuild.exe, what if I renamed msbuild.exe? So what I did is I basically just made a copy of that file. And this is basically the, the command that I used so again, you've seen this, that's the mapping the network. Hey. And then I ran copy 
overwrite. The slash b is for binary, which is I found was pretty much a requirement for this. And then it's copying ms build to, and in this case, I just stuck it in the root. So you call them backslash rt.exe. Then I'm running this against our payload. Now that got caught again. And I thought, well, you know, maybe it sees this somewhere. Maybe I need to obfuscate the actual MS build part of this. And so what I came up with was another command or chain of commands, I suppose. Oops. So this time I'm changing directory into that folder. Then I'm copying msb star.exe. So we're hiding the fact that it's ms build, but we're still getting it to be able to copy to a, a rename file. Okay. And again, just running this against rt.xml. Now, the downside to that is if app whitelisting is involved, you're renaming the file. This might not make it through uh, Windows app application whitelisting, but it is still assigned Microsoft binary. So maybe it would in certain circumstances, but there's other options for you too. You could potentially rename it to a different file uh, name, put it in a specific folder that you know that app uh, whitelisting is allowed on, things like that. So it, it's not necessarily the end of the road, but this is what I did for this demo. So let's continue on. Um, so now we've got a command where I'm, I'm getting a callback, I'm getting a shell. So let's plug this in to our Kali system and see if we can get it to work. So the first thing we're gonna do, oops, wrong pane there. We're gonna start up responder again. Interface eight zero, WPAD force authentication. Get that running. And let's go down to this pane. Let's get a netcat listener going. Uh, NC is netcat, it's a Swiss army knife of um, network tools, I think it's called. So for, for us, we're basically using it to catch our reverse shell. And so L is listen V verbose P port. And we're going to specify one, two, three, four, because that's what I had in my XML file from before. So we'll get that running. And now we're going to use our special NTLM relay command. So this is the whole thing. Um, I guess I don't need sudo for this. So NTLM relay X with SMB2 support, no Samba server, that same target and all the stuff that we just learned. So we're mapping the share. We're changing directory into the .NET folder. We're copying msb star.exe to the root. We're calling it RT for red team .exe. And then we're running that against our RT pay, um, XML payload, which is hosted by our Samba server. Lastly, we're going to delete that RT.exe just to tidy up a bit. So moment of truth, fingers crossed. Let's pray to the demo gods that this works. And what we should see if it, whoop, if it does work, is a shell callback down in that bottom pane. All right, and there we go. So, who am I? NT authority system, fantastic. And what's the host name? It's that same host that we saw before. So at this point, I've got a shell. I'm going to close out of these other two panes here so that we can focus on uh, this shell that we just obtained. So 
what was our goal with this? We're, we were trying to get on this machine so that we can try to get to domain admin, right? So we can do that with just some built-in Windows tools. Um, first one I'm gonna show you is WMIC. We're gonna do a query for um, the process lsass.exe um, and we're gonna get the process ID. So here we've got process 556. So uh, one moment here, looking at my notes. So what, what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to dump, this is the Windows logon service. We're trying to get a memory dump of that because it can contain clear text passwords and password hashes. Um, now, since we're running as the system account, this shouldn't be a problem. Um, and all that we really have to do is run a specific command. For us, Windows PowerShell has debugging uh, privileges enabled by default. So we can use it to execute run DLL 32. This is another Windows process. We're gonna have it call the comm services DLL. That DLL has something called uh, a mini dump method in it. This 556 is the process ID we just found. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna save this back off to our, our file share um, as the computer name in dump format and the full is a full dump of the process. So we'll run this. Fingers crossed again that uh, the demo gods smile upon me. <laughs> and this can take a little while. Okay, it looks like we're back. So let's switch over. Let's go to our SMB share, to our dumps folder. There's the dump we just created. So then we can use a tool called PyPyCats. Um, Python equivalent of MimiCats essentially, but uh, it can do offline analysis from our Kali box. So we run PyPyCats LSA uh, mini dump, and then we will load in that file we just got. And we get a whole bunch of stuff back. So what is all of this? Well, it's a bunch of things. Mostly it's the computer password for Win7A in various forms, Kerberos, WDigest, all sorts of different forms. Uh, here's a clear text password. That's one that we sent over. This is what happened when we, we mapped our file share. Um, you can see there's hashes in here. This is again for that Windows 7 box. So that's the, the password hash of that computer. Let's keep looking. Let's see what we got in here. Uh, oh, here we go. Username, TSPKG. So this was probably from a, a terminal server uh, session on this. So he had remote desktoped in rsmithda and here's his super secret password, one, two, three. So it looks like we've got a valid domain admin password. We can test that um, with one more command that I'll show you. So, and it's one we've talked about before. Um, so we're gonna do, uh, let's see, crack map exec SMB 172.16.48.60 is the domain controller. User R Smith, uh, whoops, DA account. Password, that super secret password, one, two, three. And the tool spits out pwned. And it does that if you've got local admin on the box. So we're local admin on domain controller 2012. At this point, we've got domain admin rights to this domain. We could do post exploit, we could do all sorts of stuff. So that's basically the end of the demo. One thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about in my final thoughts here real quick. So in this case, we just used um, a very simple reverse shell, but there were other options. Um, you can use 
lots of the command and control systems out there support MS build um, versions of their uh, payloads. Um, C2s like Silent Trinity, for example, and Covenant. Um, there's also tools like NPS payload, which you can use. You can do um, meterpreter shells through NPS payload. The other thing, if you do that, and if you get a big list, you remember that targets list? So, I guess I'm in the wrong folder. So if you get a big list of machines with SMB signing disabled, you can target them all with NTLM relay. And if you're using a C2 infrastructure, you can potentially get access to every machine on that network with just a couple of commands. So that's pretty cool. Um, during my testing, I was able to get Silent Trinity working with this. It did bypass all the AV. Um, and let's see. One issue that I did have with running Silent Trinity that way is if multiple um, payloads ran on the same machine, it tended to kind of gunk up the works of Silent Trinity. I, I think maybe it doesn't know what to do. And so when you would try, since it's an asynchronous C2, things would just start not working, right? So your mileage may vary depending on the C2 that you use. And um, lastly, the one thing that I'll mention is there is a raw command this is in a, um, so if, if you were to look at the GitHub for NTLM Relay, there is a pull request that hasn't been approved yet. Um, and this will be in my blog post that should be posted probably within the next week. Um, but there is a, um, a pull request and what it would do is it would add a raw option to NTLM Relay. Basically what that does is it allows the command to run directly without having it um, placed into a batch file first. I tested that, I merged the code manually and ran that. That worked as well and that, that basically makes it so you don't have to change the file name of the batch file and the executable. It just dumps whatever you put in there directly into the service that gets called. So um, that's definitely an option as well. And I don't know when that pull request will happen, but it's out there. If you're interested, definitely check our blog later on. And uh, that's all I've got, so. Nice job. This is um, some amazing finds. I'm so glad that you walked us through that. I um, also, I was going to mention your blog. So thank you <laughs> for doing that. I'm like, that's great. So I've been kind of watching some text go by and they're trying to figure out where to put it. And so we'll let all of you know, um, um, we're going to try to get links to that as well as um, a copy of this presentation. So um, with both of those pieces, you'll be pretty armed to kind of replicate uh, what John just showed us. So thank you. Are there any questions before we move on um, real quick that you might want to um, ask John directly? Is there anything? I know there's been quite an active chat going. So Did I see somebody raise their hand? Oh, oh, people are clapping. Oh, look at that. <laughs> nice job. I'm really, really good work with this. Um, it's just pretty amazing. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I hope, uh, hope it's useful. I hope it's been informative and educational. So. Yes, thank you. Thank you for all your hard work pulling this together. And uh, thanks for your uh, hard work actually uh, figuring this out. It's pretty amazing work. Thanks. All right. Well, good. Well, thank you. If any questions, um, you know, hit you um, before the end of this, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, or I'll put my contact information up at the end and you can um, pass them on to me and I'll make sure to get those answered for you as well. Next up, we have Brian, Brian Halbach. He is going to um, show us a little bit more demo. Um, and are you ready? Audience participation. Oh, right, so. with the audience participation. Good, good, good. So um, I'll just go ahead and uh, let you take it from here. Yeah, so uh, I'll do a little bit of talking first, then there's going to be some audience participation. I don't know what everybody's knowledge level is at. Um, 
So the purpose of the, knowledge, or the audience participation is so that I can hopefully gauge the general knowledge level of the group and then we're actually going to work through a scenario together uh, based on our cumulative knowledge and see what we can do as a malicious insider. And then I'll show you also what we can do as a malicious hacker so you can kind of get a little comparison. Um, so yeah, let's see. You guys probably want to see my screen so you can see what I'm doing. I will show you. Let's close that Come out. On, just let us guess. That's that is true. I'm very, I'm very good at describing uh, things on computers after my days in the help desk. I spent <laughs> uh, five and a half years doing help desk. And uh, one of my favorites was uh, I had to help somebody turn their Wi-Fi back on, um, but they didn't know the name for the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi icon, so they kept calling it the little stairs at the bottom of the corner, because if you look at it, it's like little bars that go up, and this person assumed that those were stairs and not the Wi-Fi icon. So I can do a very good job of describing if we need to. That um, Oh yeah, so one of the extra things I wanted to talk to everybody about, um, since we're all in uh, COVID land together, is um, some of the fun opportunities Red Team has had to do and uh, uh, things we've worked on. And one of the cool things is, uh, recently, uh, our, other, our laptops are coming up on being about five years old, which is about the time you do a laptop refresh just to make sure you're on the latest and greatest hardware. Um, and uh, traditionally, we always use Macs. And if you're paying attention to our screens and you are doing your reconnaissance and intelligence gathering, you'll notice that this is not a Macintosh that we're on anymore. Um, and this was actually a recommendation by one of our other pen testers as he found this really cool model a uh, laptop, which essentially is like a little micro server. Um, and we just got a ton of horsepower. And so because of this, we're actually able to set up fully interactive uh, Active Directory environments on our computers without taking a performance hit. Um, here, I'll, I'll show you real quick. Let me make sure there's nothing critical on my screen. Here we go. So yeah, I got this beautiful, just look at all those cores purring away. I got VMs running, barely taking a hit on performance, nine gigs of RAM out of 62 being used. I'm just so happy with this. It's just uh, real nice. And because of that, we're able to do this kind of uh, research um, where in the past, you know, the Macs are okay. The Macs performed really well, but you could generally only run about two, three VMs before the thing starts becoming slow and dragging its feet. Um, so yeah, we, we got that where each uh, each pen tester has one of these laptops and a MacBook also, so we can do plenty of virtualization. Also nice for customers' environments because we're not, you know, learning on your systems like some other companies that I won't name uh, may do. We'll actually install, you know, a, a Windows Server 2012 R2 or I'll install Windows Server 2019 and I'll start throwing um, my tax at it before I actually go onto a company's network. That way I can say, hey, I will or I will not do this attack because I know from actual real life experience that it is either a good attack to do or not to do. So that's um, just some of the stuff that's good to do in general. Um, I, I think it's great that we're doing it um, and that Red Team empowers us to get beefy computers to do all this fun stuff. Uh, so going off of that, um, let's see, I need to bring up the chat because I'll be asking questions for you to type into chat later. And so now we're going to go through another fun scenario together. And this one is the malicious insider. And for those of you who can't, who don't know or can't figure out from the name, this is somebody on the inside of your network who either goes bad because they know they're going to be fired or they're upset with what's happening and they, you know, they, they want to extract some data and start their own competing business or they want to cause havoc or they're one of my favorite cases was um one of the guys went and changed everybody's password and then quit and uh went and moved five states over without it telling anybody so those are just some examples and we're going to go through together and figure out hey what can we do what would an, a malicious insider think like how is that thinking different than a pen tester or an actual attacker and uh, you'll, you'll see some differences. So um, I set up my own Active Directory environments. Uh, my username is Ian Sider. Uh, sounds like insider. I know I'm so clever. Um, so let me get logged in. Oh yeah, there, someone's posting in the chat that um, 
they also have servers. Yeah, we also have three servers. We got four servers. Um, so some of this is hosted on my laptop. I got one, two. These are all my personal servers that are in my home office. I deleted the work one because I didn't want you guys to see the, uh, I don't know, we got 30, 40 VMs running on our work servers that are doing different jobs. Um, but just the nice fact that we can run fully interactive uh, lab environments off of a laptop without needing to VPN in and connect to work servers is real nice. So this is my own personal one that I, I got off a of Craigslist for a couple hundred bucks. Um, I would recommend people if they're really into doing research and learning how to be a better IT professional to pick up an old server and just spin it up and learn from that. Um, but do note that things can go wrong. Um, I recently just lost over a terabyte of hard drive space because I kept saying, oh, I'll, I'll properly set up RAID. I'll do that next month. I'm too busy. I'll do that next month. And then I had a failure of uh, two hard drives, uh, which cost me a whole weekend of my time getting things back up and running. <laughs> so if you do set up your own home lab, which I got running here on th uh, three servers with uh, 12 cores, 32 gigs of RAM each, um, in addition to my computer, yeah, do your research on what equipment you got um, and get it set up correctly the first time instead of keep promising yourself that you'll do it correctly and then something bad happens. <laughs> uh, so going back here, we are now logged in as Ian Sider. Uh, we are on the corporate network and we wanna do something bad. We are angry with our company. Our motivation is to find out everything we can about our corporation because we've only been around for uh, a year and we found out we're not getting a pay raise and uh, the, the guy down um, in, in our department is getting a giant pay raise. So we're angry and we want to do something. So I'm going to ask the group, uh, if you are an angry person inside of the company, what would you do? Um, I, I have a little demo fired up that we're going to look at. Um, but if, if you are an angry insider, and I know there's about a, uh, a minute to two minute delay from the chat, just from what I've been judging from people typing um, and what John was saying earlier. So I'll just keep filling time and give you guys, uh, so go to that chat in Zoom and uh, put, put on your, your black hat, uh, the, the term for a malicious actor. So put, put on your black hat and if you were bad, what would you do on this computer? on this computer that we're looking at right now. Hoping we'll get some responses soon. So how much access do they have? That is actually a great starting point. So generally, if you wanna do something malicious, you wanna see what level of access you have and where you can get to on the network. Oh, here, now we got answers coming in, great. Send ransomware to encrypt the disk, great answer, because uh, you will in fact have access to the whole uh, internal email system and you can send emails as a trusted individual. Somebody else put in the shutdown command to shut down essentially all the computers that you have access to, another great one. Uh, I actually, I like that one. We might actually try that in this demo. Um, so yeah, someone else is, uh, yeah, determine a goal or what kind of access you have. Uh, so yeah, that's actually where we're gonna start. Um, and we need to figure out what access do we have? Oh, this is the wrong command prompt. We'll look at that later. I also have a fun um, antivirus bypass combined into a application whitelisting bypass in one. So you get a little two for one, um, except it may or may not work. There is actually a patch that just came out for it. Um, so let's let's take a look first, and a uh, user is probably going to say, hey, what do I have access to on this network? Are there any file shares? Um, I'm actually currently on a flat network right now because of a failure of enterprise networking equipment. Um, I actually was having fun, and I hacked my own router earlier and took it down, which was serving DHCP. So uh, hack whatever you want, but just remember that if you break it, you get to fix it if it's your home network. And I learned that one the fun way. Oh, I, that actually gives me another fun point to share. So if anybody wants a, an old switch, I have too many of them. And if you live within the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, I will give you as many switches as you can carry. 
so please take switches off my hands. <laughs> I, have, I have too many. Um, so yeah, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look around for access. So we see there's this test nets 2019 DC server and we got some shared files, work files. Oh, and what are we going to do? Um, <laughs> this is still existing from what I tested before. We're going to upload malicious files onto the work share. Um, why is that? A lot of times work shares are only scanned at the beginning of the day. So if you, or that's the policy for this environment. So if you put the malicious files in, in this case, I put in Bloodhound, which John went over earlier. I put in Mimi Cats, which John also talked about earlier. Um, and I put in some shell code. And uh, oftentimes, unless you're running active, well, it depends on your security posture and how you're running your antivirus scans configured in your environment. Um, this is actually on a domain controller and it's set to scan once a day. So we drop it in in the middle of the day, we're good. So um, as a recommendation, what do I recommend? Uh, I'm guessing you guys can guess. Have some sort of active scan always going. As soon as somebody puts a file in there, check it, make sure somebody did not just drop in Bloodhound or Mimi Cats into the file share. Um, actually, um, in this case, I also turned off the scanning just so I could show you guys. I'm, I'm going to show you guys a before and an after of what actually happens and what gets picked up. Because I bet you're going to think shell code is going to get picked up. Well, we're going to do this together and we're going to find out. So we also have somebody else commenting, uh, before doing anything, we can disable any kind of uh, logs. That would be good. Um, we, in fact, can do that a little bit further down the line or when I get further down this attack chain. Uh, but right now, we don't have that ability yet. So our malicious insider, they want to do uh, some password spraying. So they went home and they Googled, how do I hack my company? And they they found on some forum and, and somebody just said, we'll do password spraying, duh. And this person goes, well, I, I don't know what password spraying is, but I can Google password spraying, which is exactly what they did. Um, this is a good attack, pretty simple to do. And it's something that a low privileged user can usually get away with and possibly go unnoticed. So uh, read about protecting, no, they just, they what they did is they, this YouTube video and they watched a two minute demo of what to do. So then they go out and uh, let's see, I do have antivirus running. So we're going to see if this works because this is active and this downloaded new updates uh, today. <laughs> so I want everybody that's watching right now to please pray to the demo gods or what your God of choice that this will in fact work. So we're going to go and we're going to download this and we're going to save it. Open the folder. Antivirus is still running. We're going to extract all. All right. No files have been deleted. No need for antivirus bypassing yet. So now this person needs to know what to do. So they, they go back and they, oh, there's a, this middle, to get to learn more about this tool. Uh, this is the creator of this tool, talking about the tool that he created, why he created it, how to use it, how to protect against it. Um, so if you are interested, there's a whole 10 minute video instead of a two minute demo um, out there. And so what that says is in order to do this attack, you start PowerShell. And so PowerShell is allowed right now. Uh, I would recommend for a fix to this is that you do some sort of application whitelisting. Uh, there's a free one built into Windows called App Locker where you can go and make policies and define what programs can and cannot be run. Um, I'm actually running App Locker in audit mode, I believe. Let's find out. Let's hop on my domain controller and I'll show you guys some of the behind the scenes. Uh, so for you, those of you who don't know, the domain controller is like the whole brains of the Active Directory uh, environment. Uh, and here in the brains of it, we can make, you know, I'll show you. A... So this is the behind the scenes. This is what our user wants to find. Our user wants to find this list of users. 
Um, our user wants to find what groups exist, full-time employees, IT admins, another branch. Um, they want to find what computers are in here. They want to find what domain controllers. So if they could get control of this computer, they could get control of the whole brains of the operation. Um, and so that might be one of their goals. It doesn't have to be, but it could be one of them. Uh, so I have some group policies in here. And what a group policy is, it's, it's kind of just a, well, it's kind of like what it sounds like. It's a policy for a group of users or computers within the system to do something. And so I named this one block programs with app locker GPO. Um, I'll generate what it's doing. So then if I scroll down, it'll essentially say, hey, here's the policy of uh, rules uh, for programs that are allowed to be run. And then you would have to go through and with a fine tooth comb, go through and make sure all the executables that you want to run on your domain are in there. Um, I made a corporate software installed GPO to install some software. Um, I made a disabled PowerShell. This one is not running yet, but I can enable this GPO and then show you guys what would actually happen, uh, depending if we have enough time and if that's something you're interested in. Again, this is going to be uh, some audience participation, so we'll get to see what we want. So now we need to load our password spraying. Uh, So we're going to change directories into here. And now we have on this line our domain password spray program. Uh, but you may be asking, well, how do we use that? Well, we had this lovely command called import module. And what this does, it's going to take this domain password spray module and load it into memory. Um, and then we're going to cross our fingers and see if it gets picked up by antivirus. Oh, it didn't, but we have something else that happened. Uh-oh. And so it says it cannot be loaded uh, because scripts uh, are disabled on this system. For more information, see execution policies at this link. So our user is now upset. They still want to use this, but they don't know exactly what to do. Um, so they're going to say, they're just going to grab this. And they're going to go out to Google. And uh, oftentimes, this is exactly how we do our research. We run into an error message, and we either do a brute force of make small change and then re redeploy or do it again, or we just go and see what it says. Um, and so if you actually read through here, um, it'll actually eventually show you how to bypass this. So we're, we're going to run. So our user now, he's a malicious insider, wants to know what to do. He's doing some research and he says, get execution policy. Oh, it's restricted. OK. Um, eventually, if they keep reading more and more, I'm not going to show you guys five pages of Google links, but eventually they'll get to that command. And now we've just loaded PowerShell inside of PowerShell. And we're going to try this again. Uh, this may or may not work. Oh, would, would you look at that? So it ends up if you um, if you just take that much information and you Google it, there'll be people out there who will tell you, yeah, you can set your policy to unrestricted, or better yet, this is actually what we did. We did PowerShell NOP for no profile dash execution policy bypass, and then we ran our script. So uh, thank you, Stack users on Stack Exchange. You just showed us how to hack into our company. Um, and to see that it's loaded, type a git module. And up here, we can see that we have loaded a script into memory. And again, we have antivirus running. No need to bypass yet, because nothing's happened. So then our insider, they're not exactly sure what to do. They watch that video. They just come back here and, oh, would you look at that? There's just a command that you can just copy in here. And it's going to do something great for you. 
So a attacker with not much skill other than the power of Google may, no, oh, I have to copy it again. They'll go in here and uh, they know the name of their domain, testnet.local. So they're gonna get domain user list. And if you read the instructions, it's gonna do what it says. It's gonna get a list of users in the domain and we're going to remove disabled accounts and remove potential lockouts. And this second part is very important because they don't wanna get caught. So this will actually look at one of the properties in Active Directory. Um, and one of the properties is uh, uh, amount of failed login attempts. And it'll compare the amount of failed login attempts to the total amount of login attempts that a user is granted before being locked out. And if those numbers are too close, it won't add them to the user list because it doesn't want to lock any accounts out because that could, you know, tip somebody off that this user Ian Sider is trying to do something. So once we generate our username or our user list, we're going to pipe this to an out dash file. We're going to encode it with ASCII. And we're just going to call it userList.txt. So sure enough, it tells us what it's doing. This is great uh, for somebody that doesn't have a lot of knowledge. It says it's creating a list of users to spray. There appears to be no lockout policy. Oh, maybe they want to fix that. Removing disabled users. There's 13 total users. Removing um, user within one attempt of locking out from the list. So then we got a final list of 12 users. And we see that we have this user list now. And if you remember before from me uh, showing you the behind the scenes, this list is pretty much uh, what is what we saw on the domain controller minus one account that was close to its lockout attempt. Uh, so now this malicious insider has a, a list of potential users to attack. And if you're looking at this, they're probably gonna want the administrator, that sounds good. Um, or they may want help desk admin or help desk. Because uh, they know that help desk can change passwords and help desk admin can do whatever they want. So now they go back and they want to do invoke domain password spray. So this is the important part of it. And so again, they're probably not very skilled. They're just going to copy and paste. <sighs> Sorry, <laughs> the copy and paste on PowerShell leaves a lot to be desired. Oh, darn, it didn't work. They just copied and pasted and didn't pay attention to what they were doing. And why didn't it work? Well, they gave it a password list, but we don't have a password list. And put in the wrong domain name. And our list was actually called uh, user list. So now this should work. They're going to do invoke domain password spray with a user list that was generated. They're going to correctly type the name of the domain. All right. And they're going to put it to an out file called sprayed creds. And now we need some audience participation. They need a password to guess. The one that su was suggested in here was spring 2017. Uh, so we'll give that a shot. And while I'm trying this right now, um, I want everybody that's watching to think of a possible password to guess. And then I want you to type it into the chat and we'll try a couple of these passwords and we'll see what results we get. So I'm going to try spring 2017. Maybe that'll work. Somebody else suggested password 01. COVID 2020 sucks. That's good. Oh, we actually, we got some real good ones in here.
There we go. All right, we got a we got a bunch of good ones. So we're gonna give some of these a shot. Um, I'm actually gonna exclude the domain and uh, I'm gonna try. Oh. All right, so it tried all of our users. All passwords that were successfully sprayed have been uh, put in the output file. Oh, there is no um, there is no creds one file, so that means that we didn't get any users. So let me go and scroll up. We'll try this again. But we have to remember, we only get a couple attempts before we start locking accounts out. So we have to be very careful. So I'm going to try another one. And copy and paste doesn't work into the virtual machine, I just realized. Password 01. Again, let's, let's see if we got any results. Nothing yet. All right, I'm going to do one more. So currently, um, if you remember back from actually John's demo, he had, uh, John, it was, you had, you had a user that had summer 2020. Is that correct? Yeah, I did. I think you said yes. I did. Um, but in this, in this domain, they have to have a special character. So we're going to try summer 2020 exclamation mark. Oh, would you look at that? We just got a couple users uh, because this is in fact a common uh, password uh, output where uh, we didn't get summer, tw or in this case, summer 2020 wouldn't have worked, summer 2020 exclamation mark works. It's a very common tactic that we'll do where we will put um, uh, an exclamation mark at the end of any password that we try because we know that users wanna create easy to remember passwords and we also know that their administrators are making them put in special characters. And so what are those people going to do? They're going to put that password right at the end. Uh, so uh, I recommend that if you have an exclamation mark at the end of your password, if you want to make my job harder, uh, use either a different special character or put it somewhere else. Um, let's see. I'm going to grab one this other password. All my passwords. <laughs> yeah, if this is currently your password, I also recommend changing that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do one more just because I want to see. Let's see what happens. Oh, I'm going to hit no because I need to do creds too. So uh, this user can keep trying this over and over, but uh, most attackers and especially insider threats, they're gonna take the path of least resistance. Whatever is easiest for them to do is exactly what they're gonna do. Oh, and I just realized that my text on this screen is incredibly tiny. I am sorry about that, you guys. Um, can I make this bigger? For me, it's great because I have giant monitors uh, but if you don't have giant monitors to watch this on, uh, as you can tell, I don't spend a lot of time on Windows 10, except for exploitation. This looks, oh wow, that's bigger. Can everybody see that better? Definitely. Still, okay. Let's uh, make stuff bigger. There we go. I'm sorry, everybody. I hope you can still read that. There, hopefully you can see this. Uh, I'll put a little bit better. I think I can go in and uh, properties, fonts. Let's go up to size 20. Whoa, that's big, but there we go. I know we had at least really one on user on our screen. Okay. So hopefully that's readable now. 
Um, so yeah, just to show again, now with actually readable text uh, on the presentation, we ran the domain password spring. It tells us what it is. It tells us where the success is. And look at this, help desk admin. So now um, our user has these credentials plus their credentials. They have one that's an admin. They wanna figure out what can this admin do? Um, so I'm gonna ask you guys, does anybody know of an easy way to figure out what permissions an account has? I'll give you a hint. You, you would probably just Google it and it might just show up and tell you. Net account. Uh, yes, we got, we got some answers. Get AD member. Yes, we got some PowerShell answers also. Um, so there's several ways that you can do this. There's, I can think of at least five. Um, I don't think I have the AD module loaded. I'd have to install that. Uh, net users. So net users tells us the local users. And then somebody else dropped in the name of another tool. Um, so our person is semi-skilled, let's say. They, they've been doing their research, they now have passwords, and they're getting better at uh, using the computer. Um, so they're going to use another tool. They're going to use a Microsoft tool. This one's called Active Directory Explorer by Microsoft. Microsoft. And so again, they're, they're gonna use this to figure out what they can do. So they're gonna download AD Explorer. My screen might be too big now. And they just like running everything. Oh, we need to extract all, extract all these first because it's in a zip file. They're just gonna go and click this program and we're gonna see what happens. They're gonna connect to, um, so they're gonna type in, we're gonna see if this works. We now have helped us admin and their password. And we're actually gonna get an error message back because connect to, was it expecting the domain name or was it expecting the actual um, Active Directory server? It was expecting the Active Directory server. Oh, and now it's not responding. Oh, wow, okay, so this resolved it for us. This actually picked the closest Active Directory server. So I have two, I have, in this instance, I have a Windows 2012 server and 2019. Um, they're synced up, so it connected us to the 2012 server. So now, what do we have in here? Oh, this looks like all that behind the scenes stuff I was showing you guys earlier. And in fact, it is. We got Joe Doe, and here's all the properties and information about them we, that we can gather. Uh, with these information, we can do other types of attacks, but they just wanna look around and see, hey, what can, what can the, these different uh, accounts do? So help desk admin is the one that we got. Anything interesting? What's this members of? Oh, they're members of domain admins. Uh, so they're, they're gonna go out and say, hey. Like all good hackers, they use Bing. I realize I'm uh, getting pushed for time, so I'm gonna, I may have to speed this up and not go through all the insider scenarios. Um, so essentially they're gonna say, what can I do as, as, a, as a domain admin? It'll show you a list of different uh, activities you can actually perform as a domain admin that you're supposed to do. Um, but we're gonna keep looking. Uh, and the one I wanna show you is there's also SQL server. And as they're scrolling through the SQL server, um, each one of these actually has a field called description. 
Uh, KRB TGT is a very important one. It's the key distribution center service account. This is the account that helps do the Kerberos authentication, which can be a whole two hour presentation in and of itself. We're not going to dive. We're going to we're going to talk about this a little bit. And I'm going to do a little bit of an attack on it, but um, that may be a whole nother webinar. But wait, what's the description for SQL one? Oh, the description in here is password is my password one, two, three pound. So this, in fact, um, because oftentimes people will put notes into the description. This has actually been found on actual pen tests where um, they have more than 12 users. They have something around the lines of 8,000 to 20,000 users. And somebody five years ago put a little note in the description of what the password was or a password reminder in the description. They didn't realize that this is actually viewable by most people. And uh, So I'm going to connect as our username, Ian Sider, and we're going to see what different information we can see. So I'm going to close this one. So this is actually logged in as our normal user account. We can see most of the same information. We won't get the same level of detail. But again, this is just regular user account, not the admin. Password is my password, one, two, three pound. So if you are a, uh, somebody who works for a large organization, you may want to go to your IT staff and say, hey, um, we don't have any passwords in the description field. And of course, they're going to say no. Uh, but now you know that you can, with permission, granted you're given permission, uh, you can log into your Active Directory server using your regular user account by downloading a Microsoft tool, again, no AV is getting flagged or even caring, um, and you can look around your network. So I'm gonna move into the next fun attack. So now that our user has this information, he wants, he's getting greedy, he wants more. He wants to do more things. Um, and that's when he hears about another fun attack he wants to try. Curb. Um, so lots and lots of different stuff again little YouTube tutorial of a couple minutes on how to do testing. Our attacker watches this. Let me give that a shot. So they go out and they they type in Verbrost, which was the name of the, the program that was shown on those videos. Um, they oh here's the this is the documentation. They read the documentation. Then there's multiple versions of this available on the internet. They just find one of them. They download it, or in this case, uh, they don't know how to download it. So they're just gonna copy and paste it. They're gonna save it in downloads as cribros.ps1. And again, no AV has been flagged. Nothing suspicious has happened. So we're gonna open up PowerShell again. Oh, we, we saved it here. Um, so, invoke module Kerberost. And again, this is a unskilled attacker. They watched a four minute video. They might, they may or may not even understand what they're doing. Oh, we got that uh, warning again. And, uh, but that's okay because they've already dealt with this. So they know exactly what to do. Oh, would you look at that? Now it's loaded. We got our Kerberos module. They're going to do invoke Kerberos. Um, 
There's lots of different options, but again, this is an insider threat, not super sophisticated. They're just going to hit enter. And would you look at that? If I scroll up, I'll show you what happened. We typed invoke Kerberos. It says here is a here's a hash. And if you remember from John's presentation earlier, John kept, captured hashes using Responder. This just gave us a hash. We didn't even have to do anything. So what Kerber Roasting is doing, uh, I'm going to go back and bring up. There will also be a blog post um, that I'm finishing up about Kerber, but honestly, there's so much information out about it out there that I'm just adding to the mess of already existing information. Um, but it'll, it'll be nice to see a, a write-up. So this one was about detecting Kerber Roasting, but I like this graphic because it essentially uh, it will show um, where the issues are happening. Uh, this attack can be done from a Windows computer or a Kali Linux computer. And so essentially, uh, overview of Kerberos. So we are requesting a ticket granting ticket. We're getting a response uh, of a ticket granting ticket. We're asking what the different services are on the domain and uh, uh, what they're running. And we'll actually get the um, hash of one of the services. So that was a very bad explanation, <laughs> but that's kind of what we're doing. So um, we present the ticket granting ticket to the domain controller, which gives us a ticket granted ticket granting service ticket. Very confusing. Um, and so effectively, we're asking what services are out there and if we can connect to them and it'll give us a hash of it. Uh, that's just the nature of how Kerberos works within Windows Active Directory. Uh, we actually don't write this up as a finding in our pen test reports because it's it's like all right people keep saying all right how do I how do I patch this and then we say okay well first of all you you break Kerberos on your network and then nobody can authenticate to anything but you'll be secure uh, but that's a, not a good way to do it we suggest setting up tools to help um, detect this additionally this is a giant hash that now needs to be cracked. As John showed earlier, you have to have something like Hashcat or another password cracking tool to get that. Um, generally, if your passwords are 16 characters and above for these service accounts, uh, you're going to make it too difficult for uh, a worthy adversary to be able to crack. So, um, But there's another interesting thing that we're going to look at here. This is the hash for the SQL service. Well, do we need to crack this hash? No. We don't. We already have the, the answer to that because we have this password inside of this user description. So although we did this Kerberos attack and we got this uh, service account and we got the hash for the service account, oh, and just to make it easier, it also has output format, hashcat. Uh, you probably won't notice a difference, but this is slightly different than the one above it. And it automatically puts it in the form that hashcat recognizes just to make our lives easier. Um, again, this is pretty unskilled, so make sure that you're using secure passwords for all your service accounts. And it's also one of those things that if your network is more than a couple years old, you could have 50, 60 service accounts that never got cleaned up are all out there. And uh, maybe they're being used, maybe they're not. Maybe they're active, maybe they're not. Um, so you got to make sure that you're actively pruning your Active Directory environment for items that you no longer require. And so the last thing that we're going to do before we finish up in just a few minutes is, all right, they got several sets of uh, credentials. They know that the domain administrator can do a lot, and they want to make changes on the um, domain controller. Um, and so they find out that, hey, one of the servers is Windows Server 2019. And they have been really pushing in these new versions of Windows Server to enable what's called PowerShell remoting. PowerShell remoting is like, uh, so John talked about PS exec. Um, uh, I'll, he, I think you just graced on the topic of PS exec, um, John, but uh, essentially PS remo or PowerShell remoting is like PS exec, but on steroids and it has uh, several more features. So our user goes and types PowerShell and he goes to the documentation. May even bring up a cheat. Here we go. Another security company.
But essentially, uh, this will give him all the information of what he needs to do for PowerShell remoting. So he will now try. He's, he read that document and he goes uh, session for a remote PowerShell session equals Oh gosh. I have no copy and paste, otherwise I'd paste over from my cheat sheet. Oh, here we go. So we need to create a new PowerShell session. Uh, computer name. We want the domain controller. Credential. So Nothing happened there. Well, now we have to, so PowerShell is actually an object oriented language where everything is an object. So our session variable is actually an object. If we just type it out, here are the properties of it. We have a Windows remote session to the server. Um, it's a remote machine, it's opened, it's running Windows PowerShell. So now let's enter this session, which they learned how to do from reading those blog posts. And sure enough, this looks different. We're now on the testnet 2019 DC01, the domain controller. We are in the help desk admins folder. And uh, we now have a, um, we now have a shell on the domain controller. So that's pretty cool. And that's kind of what an insider threat would do. And they're gonna upload a malicious files and they're gonna be, you know, once they get this, now they can, uh, as was mentioned before, they can use the shutdown command uh, dash m star dash t zero. So this was mentioned by somebody else in the chat earlier. We're gonna try this at the very end, um, but I have one minute left and I wanna show you the even more powerful tool that can do this. So as an insider threat, they're probably gonna be using that. Oh, that's my C2 server. <laughs> that's my local C2 server. Don't worry, you didn't actually see a real C2 server. And uh, so for an actual pen tester, um, Zoom in. They're going to be using something called uh, Evil WinRM, which is the evil version of PowerShell remoting, which has even more tools. Um, so we're going to try and connect using Evil WinRM. Um, and of course, how you do that is you go out. Oh yeah, this was the. If I had time, I was going to show you how to set up a, a Covenant C2. And all these are bypasses for antivirus, but um, antivirus never flagged us and I was expecting it to. So that's no need to bypass antivirus if it doesn't care what you're doing. Um, so um, the fun thing about, let's see, here we go, evil win RM. So of course you find this by going to Bing first and then from Bing you type evil win RM. Um, someone asked, uh, is evil win, WinRM caught by antivirus? Probably, maybe. But we're going to say that in this case, I'm, I'm running it from Kali because this is a, a Ruby script and I didn't feel like installing Ruby on the uh, Windows computer. But I don't know if it'd be flagged. But I'm going to show you that if there's an actual malicious user on your network that kind of has full reign of what they want to do, here's some of the capabilities that they now have. So. Evil WinRM uh, dash I. I'm cheating because I just know that that's the IP address of the server. I would show you how to get that, but we are out of time. Um, I know it's. Oh, here we go. This is the one I wanted. Let me increase this. Uh, so yeah, this is already pre-baked because we're at the end of our time together. We're running evil WinRM with our help desk user. 
um, summer 2020. We're pointing it to a folder that contains a bunch of PowerShell files that will get loaded into memory and not uh, trigger antivirus. And we're going to connect to the remote computer. So this looks similar, but now instead of showing the uh, computer's name, it says Evil WinRM. And if I tab, I now have an entire arsenal of evil commands ready to be run um, without any antivirus detection. If I do want to find antivirus, I can do find AV signature. Uh, let's see, now I need to menu. And then I run find. Um, so yeah, we are out of time right now. I will have a blog post later put together with some of this stuff. And uh, essentially this evil WinRM uh, is being run on the system and it's doing a, uh, it's, it's doing a technique to reflectively load the PowerShell and sh sh uh, C sharp programs into memory and bypass most common forms of detection. Uh, so generally, you have to do a little bit of AV by or AV detection first. Figure out what AV they're running. Uh, run the bypass. It actually has a built-in. Uh, so the the built-in antivirus for Windows is called AMSI Anti Malware Scanning Interface. It has a built-in bypass for it. So you just run this right away. You run your find AV signature, and then you run two other things that is loaded reflectively into memory after it's been obfuscated, and it just runs. Um, but I hope you get the idea. I'm sorry I took a little bit too much time. Um, the, I, I hope you had the fun with the working together aspect of it where I had you get, give me some inputs. But we are now going to try this command because I don't know if this is going to work. Oh, I did not. Is it a slash M? All right, so this is hopefully going to be the final thing that I do. Slash M slash T. Let's see if this works. Nope. All right. So eventually this uh, malicious insider, they can just keep doing um, slash S slash T. I'm, I'm trying to shut down uh, every computer on the domain right now. T000, someone's saying. Let's, let's try all of that. So malicious insider possibly could. Slash. Oh, our session died, so we shut down the server. Let's go take a look. Oh, yeah. So our malicious insider just killed uh, at least one of the servers. Uh, they just shut it down. Uh, they were attempting to shut down every computer in the network. It is completely possible for them to do that once they have those admin creds. Um, so yeah, I hope you get an idea of what a malicious insider can do. Um, all those things were run pretty easily without setting off AV. Um, yeah, and thank you. I'll hand it back over to Diana to wrap it up. Wow, this is really great. Well, and we rushed you. I'm sorry. We did. We probably should have planned a little bit more time, but I think this was great. I mean, there's lots of great tips that you put in there and shortcuts. I, You'd have to be asleep not to have uh, recognized all the value that you, you just showed us. So thank you. That was really mm -hmm. fun. So I think, though, what you did forget to ask, based on what we just saw, or some of the things that may still be out there, what are the next topics? Um, if uh, people want to throw some ideas up in chat. Um, or just... Oh, I do. I have material on application whitelist bypassing. I was, so one last thing I'll share with you guys. Um, I, I have application whitelist bypassing, which can bypass app locker. Uh, interesting thing though, is I was practicing it two days ago in my lab environment. Uh, with the antivirus running in an active state where it's pinging out to its antivirus servers, it caught what I was doing and it caught my malicious payload that I was trying. And in, within 24 hours, it had created a signature for the bypass technique that I was using. So when I talked earlier about this cat and mouse game, yeah, I was trying to prepare something to show you guys um, that worked pretty well for over a year. And um, yeah, they caught it two days before this presentation. <laughs> so always learning. <laughs> That is funny. Not funny. I'm, I'm sure you're like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> so good. Um, oh, 
Um, EDR bypasses, you see that one, Brian? Yeah, there's a lot of similarity between AV bypasses and EDR bypasses because with the detection response portion, um, there, there's certain tricks of the trade that we may or may not implement depending on the engagement mm -hmm. and depending on the product used. Uh, so they're all over the board. I, I like, I can do a demo of, oh no, I can't. We don't have permission from that company. Problem is, is that um, I, I can do it and I can make a blog post with some screenshots, but I don't want to get in trouble or like call out one specific vendor on a, on a webinar. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> so. Yeah, probably a good plan. Good plan. Okay. Well, um, I think we'll probably start some conversation. Um, as mentioned, um, we are going to be posting the blog that um, goes along with uh, both, both of these uh, demos as well as the presentation. So we will uh, give you more information. I do have your contact information for those of you here and we'll make sure to get that over to you. Um, any, any other questions? Any other final questions here? I'm going to just really quick uh, I'm going to try to share my last screen here that just had my contact information, but it seems to have disappeared. So, um, any final questions before we um, take off on out of here? Oh, I, I want to say I hope people are participating in virtual Black Hat and vir virtual DEF CON because I will be. I miss it not being in person and not being able to see people in person. So, okay. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So that, you know, we all, we all miss that. Everything is just so different. You know, I, I yep. just have to say one little thing. I, when I see commercials or TV shows from a while ago and I see all the people kind of gathered too closely, I kind of have like these little anxiety. I'm like, no, you guys are too close. Separate, separate. <laughs> and it's like, oh, there was a different time before this. I'm starting to forget that. Anyways, if any questions come up after today, um, anything that you want me to get some messages over to the folks, I'd be happy to do that. My contact information is on the screen, diane at redteamsecure.com or you can just certainly uh, give me a call as well. Either way will work. Uh, we appreciate your time today. Um, it's, this has been really fun. I hope that you all uh, got a little bit out of it. Is there something here for everyone? So um, Brian, John, uh, Val, and I see Tom, you're engaged as well. Thank you all for your time, your insights, and your willingness to share uh, some of your uh, top secret uh, processes with us today. Um, and yeah, we look forward to uh, learning more at the next one. I hope everyone has a fabulous evening. Uh, stay safe and be well. Take care, everyone.